Welcome to the great debate. Be it resolved, Canada needs proportional representation. Good to have everybody here. You can applaud for this. It's a Saturday afternoon in Ottawa and a room is packed with people who want to debate electoral reform. <laughs> Nothing says Ottawa like that. <laughs> and I want to welcome all former debate club alumni, which is probably everybody in this room. This is going to be a very interesting debate with the participants, Andrew Coyne, columnist with the National Post, Alex Himmelfarb, former clerk of the Privy Council, and a Broadbent fellow. They're on the yes side. Please try the spirit of neutrality for a minute. <laughs> on the no side, Michelle Rempel, official opposition critic, immigration, MP for Calgary Nose Hill, and Tasha Carradine, columnist with the National Post, and I apologize. Let me just tell you how this will work, as my job is to try to keep these people in line. Democracy in Canada, as we say, is at a serious juncture. As I wrote in McLean's a couple of months ago, nothing says screw you like democratic reform. <laughs> it is what many people on Parliament Hill think of as kind of the Dungeons and Dragons of Parliament Hill, but it's very, very consequential. And when the Liberals, who at one point were deep in the political wilderness, a location some of you may be familiar with. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. We all get there. I think everyone's got familiar with it as well. What's wrong? I'm not sure who's... It's a punchy crowd. They you. promised electoral reform to end the first-past-the-post system. It starts. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. It They're starts getting now. They're getting rowdy. And then they ended up winning 39% of the popular vote, but they took 184 <laughs> seats. And all of a sudden, yeah, you thought maybe they, their passion for electoral reform might wane. <laughs> but lo and behold, they say they're going to do it. Now, we don't know what that means. You know, they do have, as all governments do, I'll try to remain as nonpartisan as possible, they have a kind of Escher-like <laughs> quality where you're not sure if they're going up or down at the same time. But, you know, they say they're going to make a change. And Justin Trudeau has said that he likes the ranked ballot system or alternative voter, preferential ballots. This goes by many names. Some people say that is a self-serving idea. I will let the debaters decide that. But we have a bit of a history here. In BC in 2005, there was a vote to switch to STV which is not a venereal disease, but the single transferable vote. And they got close to 58%, but not the threshold of 60%. Thresholds is another issue we could talk about later as the upcoming convention. Um, in 2007, uh, I'm just saying, these are issues. Why, why, why is that a problem? Why is that a problem? Why is that, why is that a political statement? In 2007, an Ontario referendum asked its citizens if they want mixed member proportional representation. Only 37% voted for it because it was Ontario and people thought we're so important, we have nothing else to do. So this has been an issue that is critical. So over the next, here's what's going to happen. Each side will get five minutes to talk, then there'll be a free-for-all, and then you'll have a chance to use this URL. Are you all familiar with the, I guess you've used it, the vote. I'm not going to go through it, but then we'll have a vote, and you can vote to who you believe is the actual winner or who is just the winner in your conscience, and, and whatever. So this will be fun. I'm going to open the debate, be it resolved, that Canada needs proportional representation and we begin on the yes side with Andrew Coyne. Mr. Coyne. Well, thank you, Evan, and thank you, everyone, for turning out. Um, anyone who ever proposes to change anything inevitably runs up against the unanswerable objection that this would mean changing things. <laughs> Nowhere is this more true than with regard to electoral reform. 
People who at any other time can be found seething with rage at the state of our politics turn into its most ardent defenders the minute it is proposed that something actually be done about it. Like the child in the Hill Arabellic poem, we are inclined to always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. <laughs> or as it is sometimes put, what is the problem that electoral reform is trying to solve? Isn't this all rather an abstract academic exercise? At some point, somebody invariably invokes that ancient bit of corn pone philosophy, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which is very good advice, unless it is broke. <laughs> so on the way to making the case for proportional representation, as my partner will, let me first make the case against the status quo, the system known as first past the post. What I want to suggest is that many of the frustrations we have with how our politics works or doesn't work are not inevitable, but are products of that system. That the method of voting we think of as normal is in fact highly abnormal, that indeed it violates some pretty fundamental principles of democracy. If we were trying to define democracy, what might we say were its essential features? Well, you might say it's a system in which the majority rules. But that does not describe our system, does it? Not only does it only take a plurality rather than a majority to win each, in each riding, but majority governments, quote unquote, are commonly formed with less than 40% of the popular vote. Forgive me, but I think this is a pretty non-trivial objection, ruled by the minority over the majority. We wouldn't put up with it, say, in Parliament. If someone were to try to pass a law with the votes of only 39% of the members of Parliament, I'd be willing to bet there'd be riots. So how is it any different if MPs representing only 39% of the people do likewise? How else? How else might we describe democracy? Well, it's a system in which everyone gets to vote and every vote is equal. One person, one vote. But again, that does not describe our system. It's too dry to say that the proportion of seats won by each of the parties bears no relation to their share of the popular vote. What that really means is that some votes count for a lot more than others. For example, in the last election, it took 38,000 votes to elect each liberal MP. By contrast, it took one and a half times as many votes to elect each conservative, twice as many to elect each New Democrat or Bloc Québécois MP, and of course the 600,000 plus Green voters were rewarded with exactly one seat. Or consider the 1993 election. The Conservatives, you'll recall, with 16% of the vote, were reduced to a humiliating two seats. Meanwhile, the bloc surged to 54 seats on the strength of 13% of the vote, while the Reform Party, with 19% of the vote, got 51 seats. Again, if ballots were issued to some voters but not others, or in packs of two or nine or 29, depending on which party you voted for and what riding you lived in, there'd be riots in the streets. Nor are the inequities of first-past-the-post randomly distributed, because only the candidate with the most votes in each riding is elected. First-past-the-post rewards parties that can bunch their votes geographically. So parties that take an aggressively regional approach like the Bloc typically benefit at the expense of parties with a broader national outlook. For the same reason, parties will typically be shut out of whole regions of the country, though they may represent a quarter or more of the voters, the Liberals in the West, the Tories in Quebec, and so on. In some provincial elections, the same phenomenon results in one party winning all the seats in the House, or nearly so. What, the, what kind of democracy is one party and no opposition? How else might we define democracy? Well, it's a system in which you can vote for the party of your choice. Except you can't as often as not in our system, not if you don't want to split the vote. How often have you been told that you can't vote for the party you prefer, but must vote for a party you don't like, to prevent a party you detest from getting in. Indeed, most of the votes cast in any given election might as well not have been. You all know that if you live in one of the many safe ridings across the country where the result is a foregone conclusion. Why even bother? But in any riding you'll hear, don't waste your vote, quote unquote, on a party that can't win, because first past the post is a winner-take-all system. In sum, the present system allows the minority to rule over the majority. It gives some voters many times the voting power of others. It denies many voters the right to vote for the party of their choice and wastes the vote of many others. Oh, and it nearly killed the country a couple of times besides. Other than that, it's a pretty good system. <laughs> Andrew Coyne, 
Okay, let us move. By the way, we encourage the applause and, 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 and all participation. Let's go to the no side. Kicking off the no side, Michelle Rempel to respond. Michelle Rempel? Canada needs proportional representation. In this debate, one has to first define what we mean by stating this. For the purpose of this argument, I'll assume that we mean that Canada needs a federal government that is comprised of representatives elected through a proportional representation electoral system. So then we must ask, it, what is the purpose of the federal government in Canada? Of three levels of government that we have, this level of government deals with areas of law listed in the Constitution Act of 1867 that generally affect the whole country. In developing policy that affects the whole country, one would also hope that the federal government would seek to keep the country knit together through policies that don't undermine its unity, that is, avoiding policy that pits one region against the other, or gives one advantages that the others don't have. So how does this happen in our current electoral system? When policy is debated in our parliament, inevitably, it's vetted through a national unity lens that is shared, a shared value of all the major political parties currently sitting in the House and is likely the only person in this room who has sat at the federal cabinet table of our country, government policy is vetted by cabinet committees that have members from each region of the country sitting there, united under a party banner that supports the principle of national unity. So if we agree to the merit of this principle, does Canada need PR? Proponents of PR for Canada often compare Canada as an outlier against countries around the world that currently employ PR. However, where this argument fails is that Canada's nationhood depends on the unity of a highly regionalized and diverse country. No one will argue that Quebec is very different from the prairies, which are in turn very different from Atlantic Canada. And each of these areas can experience different economic fortunes at different times, given their economic, geographic, and cultural diversity. This diversity, when knit together under the banner of smart national policy, makes Canada greater than the sum of its part. This is very different from other countries in the world that do not have the geographic breadth and regional diversity that Canada has. It's often argued that one of the dangers of PR is that it allows parties with extreme ideologies to gain power. And in the Canadian context, I'd argue that PR could give rise to something perhaps more dangerous, and that being the normalization of regionalized political parties that primarily advocate for, for a, not for national policy, but against it. But what about the bloc, Blondie? Well, if we were to rewind the end of 2008, one of the primary arguments from, for, from proponents of national unity was that the bloc would have seats at the cabinet table and that a separatist agenda would be pushed. Today, even if we saw this scenario emerge in a minority government coalition, there would be electoral consequences for parties that promoted separatist policies, or there would be a national unity crisis. Following this train of logic, speculation about how political parties would be motivated to support changing to a PR system or not is likely moot, as PR will likely encourage the splintering of our national parties into their component parts. For example, hypothetically speaking, if a social democratic party ran a campaign on a centrist policy agenda after leading in the polls and then lost, significantly, <laughs> under PR, its socialist caucus, its Quebec wing, its union wing, and its moderates might look at each other and realize they don't have a lot to unite around, and that it would perhaps be easier for individuals to gain power to further their ideological or regional agendas by forming new parties. I suspect a similar phenomenon might occur on the right. And a party like the Liberals, which is ideologically void in most respects, could either find no constituency... <laughs> Could either, could either find no constituency in fold or a massive one that could lead them uh, lead unopposed for years. But Rempel, every vote should count. <laughs> this argument is predicated on the assumption that if you cast a ballot for a party, they should automatically be allocated seats. And by this logic, if someone trains to run a marathon and successfully completes it but doesn't win it, their participation didn't count. Strengthening participation of the electorate in the electoral process is vital to ensure the vibrancy of Canadian democracy, but won't necessarily be solved by simply Im implementing PR. Additionally, most PR systems employ a threshold under which parties are excluded from gaining seats. In the Canadian context, with numerous regional and ideological parties that would inevitably rise out of a PR system, many parties would not meet the threshold to gain seats. This is a reality. For example, in recent elections in Slovakia under a pure PR system, 343,000 votes, or over 13% of the votes cast, were cast for parties that did not win any seats. So does this mean that over 340,000 Slovak votes didn't count? So does Canada need proportional representation? Clearly, that's debatable. So I'll close with this. 
If we're going to engage in an electoral system change in this country, the, electoral, the electorate needs to be engaged in a significant way, and a referendum is a perfect way to do that. Okay, thanks, Michelle. So we'll, obviously we'll pick up some of those points later as the free-for-all round, which is a technical term, by the way, uh, <laughs> will take place. Uh, let's go back to the yes side and hear now from Alex Himmelfarb. Alex. Thanks. But Rempel, every vote should count. Um, <laughs> I hadn't actually prepared a five-minute talk because I thought after Andrew spoke, it would be so clear that our, our system was broken, that we needed an alternative. And just to be clear at the outset, there is only one alternative to winner takes all, and that's proportional representation. There is no other alternative. <laughs> winner take all and proportional representation might both, be, uh, introduce, might both introduce ranked ballots, but the choice is clear. Winner take all or proportional representation, and as no one here could deny after listening to Andrew, proportional representation is our only alternative. Now let me explain why I believe that's the case. The biggest argument for it is that PR produces a more representative parliament. And for a representative democracy, it seems to me for a representative democracy, representativeness ought to count for something. <laughs> that, that strikes me as a good idea. So a more representative uh, democracy, especially in a, a country as, our, as ours, which is diverse in interests and values, that ought to be reflected in our parliament. But it's, it's, it's more repre effectively representative of, as well of the regions, not in the divisive way where our current system amplifies regional differences because it's entirely conceivable, in fact, has occurred, that entire regions could be shut out of government in, with no voice to influence the government of the day. PR ensures that that doesn't happen, that every region will have a voice in the government of the day. It all, in that respect, it's likely to promote unity instead of amplifying differences. And third, it provides the individual the constituent with better representation because unlike the current system where it often, for in fact, often the majority of Canadians, the only representative they have in Parliament is somebody they didn't vote for and probably would never vote for. And under, under almost every PR system, you will find somebody with like mind, somebody who may share your interests. If you're a woman who believes it would be better to talk to a woman, you're more likely to find better gender and ethnic representation. So in fact, it strengthens the bond between constituent and parliamentarian. It does mean every vote counts. Every vote, or virtually every vote, depending on the system, makes a difference in the electoral outcome. It, not surprisingly, PR systems have higher degrees of, of voter participation, higher degrees of voter engagement, and that, too, stream, seems to me, is pretty uh, central to a stronger democracy. It also means every region counts. That you cannot have a government that takes for granted the safe regions, ignores the impossible to win regions, and works only on swing ridings. And think of our elections. You know, when we see these horrible elections, polarized parties that are, share 90% of the same agenda, throwing each other under the bus, the, that's not inevitable. And, you, know, you keep reading journalists who say that's the way politics is. That's the way politics is in a winner-take-all system. In a system where cooperation is going to be the norm and every vote counts and you have an, a possibility in every region of electing a diverse range of voices, every region counts. You can't simply focus on the swing ridings and you can't take for granted any region. It's a system that creates incentives for political cooperation, cooperation in Parliament, and that means a less divisive, less polarized, and less ugly politics. There is a way to get a better politics. In, in the 12 minutes I have remaining, I should quickly, <laughs> I should quickly deal with, with some of the myths that are going to, to 
be trotted out in, in opposition. Number one, this is not a loopy idea. The vast majority, the vast, you know, with hidden risks, and oh my God, it's changed, we better not do it. The vast majority of advanced democracies, over 75%, have already done it. Over 90% of OECD countries have already done it. Canada's had 12 commissions, all of whom propose it. <laughs> it sure makes it seem like winner take all is a loopy idea with a lot of hidden risks. Oh, those risks aren't hidden. Um, <laughs> the notion that we're going to break the bond between the constituent and the parliamentarian, not true. In a country like ours, whatever model of PR we use, it's going to uh, in include regional or geographic representation. I have 12 other myths. But, but you're out of time. But I'm out of time. <laughs> but the good news is there'll be more. Hold on. Okay. Alex Himmelfer. Okay. Almost taking a disproportionate amount of time on proportional representation, but he actually got exactly in at five minutes. Now we move over to the no side for the final presentation on that side before the, we mix it up a bit. Tasha Carradine on the no side. Thank you. <laughs> Just do it, because everyone else is too, Alex. I've heard that before. And you know what? I reject that argument as much for PR as I do where else it's used. Because Canada does not need PR. Contrary to what my opponents say, the system is not broken. The conversation, hear me out. <laughs> the conversation around PR grows legs whenever people are dissatisfied with the performance of their government. And let's be honest, a lot of Canadians, even within the governing party, felt that way in the past few years. This happens with governments all the time. They hit their best before date. This does not mean that the system that produced them has hit its best before date. Let's take the case of the current government. The Liberals were elected by only 39.5% of the population. My God. The other 60.5% should be rioting in the streets, Andrew. To quote you, their votes counted for nothing. They were excluded. Their voices were not heard. Oh dear, wait a minute. According to Abacus data, 70% of Canadians approve of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's performance. 51% of them would pass the budget. Ipsos' latest poll found that 66% of Canadians approve of the new government. And Forum Research has the Liberals at 46% of the popular vote. God, that's nearly half. That's up 6.5% since the election. So the, the Liberals were elected by this first-past-the-post system by a minority of Canadians, yet a majority of people are happy with them, for now. Under a PR system, would they be significantly happier? Let's think. There, the Liberals would have had just over about, four, or just roughly 40% of the seats. They would have had to govern in a coalition. Maybe they would have governed with the NDP, and they would have brought in a balanced budget. But wait. <laughs> Maybe they wouldn't. <laughs> but maybe they wouldn't. Because you see, if there had been PR, the other parties, as Michelle said, would probably have looked very different. The Conservative Party might have split apart like a deranged atom, yielding a pro-life party, a pipeline party, and a progressive Conservative Party. Maybe the Liberals would have coalesced with that. Or maybe the NDP would have fractured into a Sanders Socialist Party and a New Mulcair Party. I don't know. Maybe the Liberals would have split into... Wait a minute. I don't think the Liberals will split into anything. Hmm. Which means that under a PR system, they will likely end up leading the coalitions every single time. Wow, Canada really needs that. Under PR, as Michelle suggested, parties like the NDP and the Tories, who are more ideological in nature, would no longer have to resolve major policy differences. They could simply break into their component parts. Add to that fact that Canada has vastly different regional and cultural interests, and PR would encourage division, not unity, as my esteemed opponent claims. It would also encourage fringes. Britain voted down an attempt at PR a few years ago, in part because their far-right UKIP party would have vaulted from one to 80 seats. This is the party that wanted to allow gender and racial discrimination in the workplace. Slovakia, as Michelle mentioned, recently had their elections, and they've always had PR. 
Now, with the migrant crisis, two neo-Nazi parties received a combined 8% of the votes and 14 seats. And if you think extremist fringe parties cannot form government, you're wrong. It happened in Austria with Jörg Haider's Freedom Party in 2000. Under PR, fringe parties can also push governments in directions that are religious, such as ultra-Orthodox parties in Israel. What if we had a Christian fundamentalist party in Canada, or a Sharia law party that elected members? You know what? I agree with Alex, this would be more representative. But does Canada need that? I'm not so sure. Another problem with PR is losing the local element. And while my opponent, Andrew, has written that PR could elect people on a local basis, if, for example, each riding elected from a list, you could do that, but then you would need more than one representative per riding. That would mean electing more than the 325 MPs we already have. Do we really want to do that? Is making government more expansive and expensive our goal? Do we need that? I don't think so. If we don't increase the number of representatives, they would be picked from a master list, as is the overwhelming majority of countries that have PR. This would increase the clout of, guess what, the leader, and diminish that of everyone else in the party. You think party discipline is too strict now? Under PR, it would be worse. And the fate of a party more than ever would depend on the popularity of its leader, because local representatives would count for less. Think about that one for a moment. I know you already are. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks, Tasha. Opening remarks are done. Now we'll have a quick period of rebuttal, and we have about 30 minutes for the free-for. I'm going to go back to Andrew Coyne. There's a lot to cover here. Everyone's made some great points. I'm going to give you a chance to rebut. There's some issues about the devil being in the details, proportional representation in general. Many people like the idea, but then when you get down to the details, people can't seem to agree what form. But Let's start with the rebuttal. You've listened to Tasha and Michelle. Top line responses or picking up on how big this problem might actually be? Well, let's actually deal with how PR works in the real world rather than in some fantasy of what, how it might work. Um, I'm mystified, first of all, by the suggestion that the problem with PR is it would encourage more regional parties. I thought the case was pretty well established that first past the post is the system that rewards and encourages and incentivizes people to plump their vote regionally. PR would give the chance for, for parties that were, their, their vote was spread nationally, it took a national view to do rather better. It is probably true that, however, that you would have a few more parties than we have now. I don't necessarily think a little more choice among voters is, is a terrible thing. If you look at the countries around the world, as my partner mentioned, most of them having PR or some form of it, uh, they tend to have seven, maybe eight parties. Uh, we have five now. Is two more going to kill us? No, it's going to give us a few more options. So I think the, the uh, it's certainly, you know, the, the objection that it would lead to voting for more extreme parties seems to me to be an argument that says people might vote for the wrong parties, therefore we should rig the system so that the system doesn't look anything like what they voted for to deny them the choice that they wanted to vote for. <laughs> Final point I'll say is, it is true, you know, if you're going to make the argument that we shouldn't have PR because that's the system in Slovakia or that's the system in Israel, I could as well say we should not have first past the post because that's the system in Zimbabwe. <laughs> Which is to say, the particular circumstances of each country are kind of important, not just the electoral system. All right, Michelle Reppel to respond. Michelle, would you like to respond? The point of debate today is not the merits of PR or not. The debate is, does Canada need PR? And what my colleagues failed to do in both of their remarks was refute our points about Canada needing PR in the Canadian context. This is why I brought up the point of a regional, regionalized country. We are different than Germany, than Slovakia, than Israel, because we're really big. We have different regional economies, we're culturally diverse, and strong national policy, be it if it comes from the left or the right, is what contributes to our pluralism. So they failed to do that, and I want to just go very quickly if you'll, through three points. First of all, uh, Mr. Himmelfarb said that it would allow a more representative democracy. Does a more representative democracy mean that we need to open up our, part, uh, open up our political system to a system that allows the rise of extreme parties. He didn't, make that, he didn't make that argument. 
He also said it allows more representative, it would allow for more women, more diversity in our representation. He didn't talk about the fact that a lot of the reasons why women don't participate in politics in, in, in Canada aren't necessarily tied to our system of electorate. There's social inclusion issues, poverty, the ability to fundraise, childcare. All of these things are what we need to look at. PR is not going to fix that overnight. He also said, Mr. Himmelfarb, that other countries have done this, and again refuted, ref did not come back to refute any of our points. So that's a logical fallacy. He's not going through these arguments. And if we're going to ask if Canada needs PR, then we have to talk about the Canadian context. Finally, Mr. Himmelfarb brought the, um, brought the point up that it would encourage more voter par participation. In the last federal election, uh, Preliminary results, it was 17.5 million out of 26 million registered voter, uh, voters voted, or a turnout of 68%. Well, in Switzerland, in an uh, MMP system, their last election saw 48% turnout. So that's also a false dichotomy when you're looking at results internationally. My point being is this. I, I do not refute any sort of debate that we need to have around strengthening our democracy. I think I, you know, there's a lot of things I share with Andrew in terms of making sure that Parliament is more meaningful, that we have meaningful debate. And just to close that off, very quickly, Evan, to say that because Alberta, let's look at Alberta. Alberta voted mostly conservative, okay? Mr. Himmelfarb brought up the answer that while some regions were shut right out of government, that argument means that my constituents don't have a voice, and that's wrong. Because like my voice or not, they've got a pretty strong one. So this, this all boils down to how we govern our behavior and how we participate in our democracy. And changing the system in the Canadian context doesn't automatically right, do that. Let me get Alex Himmelfarb to respond to that. We, we're going to move quickly now. Listen, Alex Himmelfarb. I think in, in a number of ways you've made a strong case for why Canada does in fact need proportional representation. Um, yeah, imagine this hypothetical situation. Imagine a government sitting around having a political discussion where their political advisor, the, the guy on the ground, the woman with the numbers says, you know, we can ignore, we can ignore Alberta. Alberta is not going to be there for us. Not and, on my watch. And not, a, not, not this one. You could ignore a whole other province. The, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, okay. I, I don't see you like burning up the Atlantic, but in any case, the, <laughs> the, the, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is you, you know those discussions go on and those are not healthy discussions. Governments ought to govern for the whole of Canada. With respect to these loopy parties, you know, the, the panelists here wouldn't probably agree on which are the loopy parties. <laughs> or, or even on whether some of those parties have won through the first past the post system. It's not even possible we don't agree on the loopy party. So isn't it a good idea to let Canadians agree? And it's not that hard or beyond design, as many countries have done, to create thresholds or, or preferential transferable votes that make it hard for small parties to, to win without substantial support. And you can always find the example. The reason I said that almost everybody has this isn't to say they have it so we should have it. It's to say you can point to Israel and Italy, as it always happens, or some of the Eastern European countries, or you could point to Germany and Norway and Denmark, Sweden, Sweden and Netherlands, and you know what? They're doing pretty good. So, uh, j just in time, I, I want Tasha okay. that this is the mix it up round, not the mix final it. statement round. Okay, Tasha. all right, all right, let's mix it up. All right, here we go. Alex, you know Tasha. what? The, what you're saying about loopy parties, and the threshold. That's very interesting because if you look at the countries that have mixed member proportional or proportional representation, first of all, most of them have party lists. They do not elect local, which I will address in a second, but they also have thresholds. And if you apply some of those thresholds, such as 5%, 4%, which is a very common one, you know what? In the last election, none of those smaller parties would have any seats in Canada. The big three parties would have had all of them agreed the situation would probably produce more votes for the smaller parties because people would feel comfortable. They'd say, I'm not wasting my vote. I can vote for the Marxist-Leninist party. I don't have to vote NDP. Great. So, so, just saying, just saying. Think about that. Pandering to the Marxist Just saying, but again, by imposing thresholds, you're defeating your entire point, which is 
every single vote should count. As you said, it's winner take all, or it's every single vote counts. So which is it? You're asking for something that is in between. Next point, on local representation, both of you have denied my esteemed opponents that local representation would be affected. I disagree. As I said, if you wanted to have local representation, you would need to move to having more than one person representing each district. Andrew, you've written that Canada could be considered a region with a list, but that's unlikely to happen in Canada because we are so diverse. We have so many interests. In other words, we have a much bigger parliament than we want now, and we would not have politicians with that local connection. And there are many people from this room. Think of Libby Davies, for example, who fought for the rights of the people of the Lower East Side as a community activist and then became a politician. Or David Christofferson, who was in Hamilton with the trade union movement, moved up through different levels of government. These people were successful politicians because they were connected to their community, they were rooted in it. And that is what PR's strength is. Now, I agree PR has many problems. Yeah, I see you waving. Give me one second. I'm doing the Bernie Sanders. PR has many problems, but it also has many virtues. And why would we say we want to replace one set of problems with another? That is all we would be doing by changing to your system. So I see the wave as well, Bernie. Thank you. Go Sorry. Ahead. <laughs> uh, Tash is absolutely right that in no system does absolutely every single vote count. So even in proportional representation system, you get a few people, maybe 5% at most, whose votes don't count. In our system, more than 50% of the votes are not counted. Oh, that's not it's true. a completely different order of magnitude. No, 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 no. So no, 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 when no, no. you talk about local representation, under our system, you get local representation if you have to happen to vote for the party that has the most votes in your riding. Yeah, you get represented. But the rest of them are not represented in the same way. I know that legally the MP represents every person in their riding. But if it didn't matter which party the MP was, we wouldn't have elections. Michelle wants Let's to jump in. MP. Hold on. Michelle wanted Let's to jump in. MP. Michelle. Look, um, I am all for strengthening de democratic participation. I wish more people in this country would be as engaged as this room is, even though we don't share our ideology. But to say that somebody going to a ballot box, putting the ballot in there, that their vote hasn't counted, that they don't participate in the democratic process, is wrong. Just because you don't elect someone with your ballot doesn't mean that you haven't made a difference. It's not like your it ballot happens. has gone in the garbage can and hasn't been it counted. Has. Your, vote has not it's, your vote has not contributed to electing no, anybody. You, Andrew, you haven't made this point, and nor have you guys made the point about PR in the Canadian context. You've talked about Israel, Germany. We've used that as, as examples on what could happen, but we talk specifically about regionalization and Canada's differences. So in closing, I would love to hear a solid, cogent argument on and why Canada needs PR. Canada, not Germany, not Israel, not anything. Canada. Specific. And Andrew wants to, I just, I, by the way, I know Andrew wants to respond. At one point, you, when we had the per vote subsidy, of course, even if you lost, at least it counted and parties could when that was canceled. So that was, a, that, that was supposed to smooth out some of the hard edges, but I know Andrew wanted Specifically to make Canada. We have a, a country that is extremely regionalized, that has existing regional divisions, and our electoral system pours salt in all of those wounds every election. We have no conservatives in Atlantic Canada. We have no conservatives in Atlantic Canada this election. If we had PR, we'd have a large contingent of conservatives in Atlantic Canada. We have historically had very few and who liberals. Would choose who those people would We've be? historically had very few liberals in Western Canada. We had very few conservatives in in Quebec. But there's a reason but a, for that. No, right? but the reason the was the system energy. wildly distorted no. their representation. No, you could get 20 percent. You could get 20 percent, 25 percent of the vote in a given region and get two there's seats. Before this starts no to sound in like Parliament. In any system, and it's not. in any system, let me go to Tasha. Tasha. Okay. I was going to say, Andrew, and who would choose who those MPs would be? There would be a list. The party would choose that list. Yes, that is how it works in 90% of PR countries, and you know this. The result would be the result would be that those MPs would not necessarily be the people that the region wanted, and there would be no power. Another issue, and no power to get rid of your local MP because you would not vote for a local MP. The party could reappoint people you disagreed with. Different system. It is true. So, some people, okay, hang on, I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Because this is, this is our issue, some people are yelling out false. I want you to respond to that. I don't see why it would be false. If you have a list, if the party, the goal is the party would have a list of representatives from a region, the party would choose, based on a proportion of votes, Wait. how many of those people would then get seats. No, no, some that, people that, would be left off and some false. people would be in. You know why okay. it's hang false? On. Alex, I, hang on, Alex, hang on. Well, Alex, then Michelle. Yes. Alex, let me tell Alex you why it's false. It's false because it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> In, in 
almost invariably what the commissions have recommended are systems that allow for local representation, whether it's single transferable vote or mixed uh, hybrid systems. They have local representation like they do now. Now, it, it is yeah, true. It is true. They have multiple members, which give exactly. them which I mean, give them the possibility of finding somebody of like mind or shared interest, and not have to deal with somebody. How much do you want to spend on our parliament, Alex? How big do you want it to be? I'm talking about larger writings. Larger too. writings. I would like oh, to have Axel's over the Atlantic Kingdom. Michelle, Alex, let me just let Alex finish his point, and then Michelle, Alex, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, the, it's, it's very hard to argue against fallacies. <laughs> you know, it, it, I mean, it's embarrassing to say, well, that's bullshit, over and over. I mean, okay, I, two, I, two, I, two, right. two, two quick, two hold quick, on, quick hold points. Hold two quick points. <laughs> two quick points. Two, number person. one, hold the, hold the on. working assumption, if you look at every commission, is there would be local representation. Yeah every commission, local representation. And yes, there are systems that are designed otherwise, but not for Canada. And number two, the evidence is overwhelming that this would be a unifying force in a very diverse country. All right, I got, let me go to Michelle. And also, I, I should just remind everybody that, that though that is unparliamentary language, it seems very at home in the Broadband Institute debate forum, so it's totally fine. Michelle. I have one rule in politics and for my public service. It's one very simple rule. And I think it's actually the rule that most, when people fail in politics, is what they violate. And it's, at the end of the day, I'm first and foremost accountable to the people who represent, who I represent. And even if they didn't vote for me, I am accountable to them. So I'm going to qualify Tasha's argument. When talking about a party system making a list, we have to make sure that we don't lose the component of us being able to represent our constituents. There have been times, there have been times in which I have not agreed with my party. You may have, you may have seen it in my vote, or you may, have, you may not have seen it because it's in my caucus process. But what I never had to worry about was whether or not my constituents, I would ha keep my place based on if my constituents didn't support it or not. And I think that's the argument mm -hmm. Tasha is trying to make is that we cannot, and I'm not saying that we would necessarily lose all of that component, but in PR, especially in Canada, where we have such a diverse regional country that you can't deny, that connection is even more important. And just to toss salt in the wound, because you know, Andrew said it, um, the, you know, saying we didn't do well in Atlantic Canada, okay? Okay, no, we didn't. There's no secret there. Um, <laughs> but I think that Many of you would be surprised that the most traffic I've gotten in my office for letters in the last month and a half have been from Atlantic Canadians who are saying, when you stand up in the House of Commons and you talk about fighting for Alberta jobs in the energy sector, you need to talk about me too, because I can't go there and work anymore. So I just think that we need to, well, there was a comment about the Liberals, which I'll let slide, but <laughs> nonetheless, I think the component is, is that in our system right now, we still do have the ability to speak for all regions, and it's because our system there and people that are in it can choose to speak for national issues, right, and, and it's Andrew, something that we can't lose. Andrew wants to jump in. Andrew, Coyne. Well, it's, it's lovely that people from Atlantic Canada are sending you letters, but it'd be nice if they could elect MPs to represent. <laughs> um, look, let's... How, let's does that, how does that happen? It, it, nobody is going to propose any system of PR that does not have local representation. I hope that's absolutely clear. But let's deal with this question of lists, because not all PR systems, first of all, use lists. Those that do, not all of them have the party brass choosing the members of the list. They can be elected by the members at large. People can choose the names off the list. They don't have to just have it take, take it from the bottom. People, voters can vote directly off of the list. So even systems that have lists are not the caricature that are being presented. And nobody in this, and certainly I'm not proposing a list of them anyway. STV, the model that they voted on in BC, that 58% of British Columbians voted for, actually give, makes for better and local representation and more autonomy for each NP within the party. Why? Because if you, if you are able to cross party lines, if you get second and third choice votes from other people, then as an MP, you don't have to depend upon the party to support you. Can, you can have a, a, a brand and an authority outside of just your own base. And so what you in fact see in, in Ireland and in Australia, you, you see people with greater degree of independence, greater degree to represent their riding to the party rather than representing their party to the right. But, Wait, Andrew, can, I, can, can I just, uh, okay, hang on. I just want to ask Andrew and, and Alex because, 
you know, the 2004 Law Commission of Canada had the recommending a form of proportional representation. But the, again, I, let me just get to the devil in the details, it, because the, the Trudeau Liberals are saying they have the rank ballot, and a lot of people think that's a fix, because it will favor them and solidify their power. So you could say, I'm for proportional representation, win that debate, but still, it might be very self-serving. The details matter. Well, what is the form of proportional representation that's actually fair? Be very clear that a pure rank ballot is not proportional representation. Yes. As Alex said, that's, that's just a winner-take-all winner system where you have to get 50 percent of the vote rather than the 30 percent. Uh, so pr the, 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 the absolute defining feature of any proportional system is multi-member writings. Whether it's large districts or small ones as in STV, it's multi-member writings. That's what allows you to have, instead Wait. of having one party with 40% of the vote getting 100% of the representation, 40% of the vote gets you two-fifths, let's say, of the representation. So if you have five members in a writing, you get two of them rather than all five. Yeah, well, exactly. Exactly. This is what you're going to. You are going to change not only how people vote, but the boundaries of writings, the yeah. composition of... We are not a small unitary state such as Italy, which, Alex, you said it doesn't produce divisive politics or, or nasty politics. My God, do we want Berlusconi in this country? I don't think so. But the point is with the multi-member ridings, Andrew, the multi-member ridings, yes, you would, in a country as large as Canada, that will be great to have an MP who will have to travel from God knows where. I know MPs travel enough. One end of a riding to another, which is now twice as large because you do not want to increase the members of Parliament from 325 to 600. Look, um, yes, Germany has mixed member uh, representation. They have two houses of Parliament. Yes, do we want to have two elected houses of Parliament? We already have two houses of Parliament, and one of them, well, I know we'd like to do with, maybe we can get rid of the Senate and put in Andrew's um, multi-member parliament, okay. But I don't advocate that either. I've given him an idea for a column. I can see it coming now. Okay. For a split second, I thought you were switching sides no, there for a second. No, I'm not. Go ahead. But this, I, I should say, I think, I this, think, is actually, this is actually a legitimate objection, <laughs> in, in part. The 90 percent, the 90 percent, I mean, most of our population, 90 percent of our population lives in urban areas. So, in fact, you could have multi-member bodies quite easily in those areas. What, may be the, what you may wish to do is have some kind of hybrid where in the north and in, in large urban rides, you'd have one member per riding. There's no reason why we have to have an absolutely you know, uniform system all across. We can have a hybrid system. That's going to be part How of the debate. How complicated do you want? You said it, it's either winner take all or everyone's vote counts. Look, PR is the, sort of, the same type of thing, if you did pure PR, as applying a one member, one vote system to parties. We don't do that either. Why? Because we allocate points to ridings because regions and ridings should have the same weight. Under your system, they would not. It would be incredibly complicated. You would be rejigging everything and changing the way representatives deal with their local constituents. And that is something that we can't ignore, as Michelle said. All right, Al Alex, I know you want to jump in. You know, one of the arguments some make for first past the post is everyone says it's very rigid, but we've had all minority governments, parties have risen and fallen. It's mm -hmm. actually proven, despite its own, the, the facts of it, mm -hmm. to be very flexible. The evidence has been we've got parties changing, living and dying, going up and down in the polls. Is that a sign that it's, it's healthier in reality than it might be on paper? Or unhealthier in reality than it might be on paper. <laughs> Another way of looking at what you said is a 2% shift in vote means a massive change in who the minority is. You can have a, a majority government with 30%, 39%. Imagine that, a majority government with 30%. It's almost inconceivable. And what do you see? You see the Harper Conservatives, the Harper government, spending its first years undoing everything, the daycare, the, the uh, Kelowna Accord, just undoing the work of the previous government. What are we seeing now? <laughs> the same thing in reverse. That's unstable. What you get, what you get in proportional representation is durable policies because they're built out of cooperation oh, well, because you don't yeah. get so these policy yeah. lurches because they're more able to take on the tough issues. You know, there are three, there are three arguments you constantly hear against PR. One of them is too complicated because, you know, after all, the voter's really stupid. Well, <laughs> I don't know very many voters who can't count to four or figure out how a pre preferential ballot works and have a little bit of diversity across the they country. They rejected it across the country. Well, they haven't, actually. And by the way, countries mature and people change their minds. The, 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 second, thing, the second thing that, that is always trotted out is it might not be good for some
some party or other party, and that's the dis most distorting element in the debates on PR. Who, first of all, you know, when we changed the electoral financing laws, the president of the Liberal Party wrote us saying, dumb as a bag of hammers. End of the Liberals. No party can adjust to this. This is crazy. No more liberal majorities. Hello? <laughs> Parties adjust. And by the way, the bottom line is PR is about people and strengthening democracy. It's not about strengthening parties. <laughs> Michelle Lepper. So, so Mr. Himmelfarb raises the point of durable Alex. policy. Alex. <laughs> um, durable policy. Um, I, I take offense to that. Uh, but it's uh, true. No, it's wrong. <laughs> It's wrong. Durable policy shouldn't be what we're seeking after. Um, if we had durable policy, same-sex marriage would still be illegal in this country. We need to change with the electorate as we go along. Ah, I'm, I'm serious, right? And the rise of parties that are formed on ideological, rigid ideological stances, as we see in other countries, I'm not sure would benefit the, plura the uh, pluralism that unites our country across regions. And when we talk about durable policy, I think we can talk about principles, like the NDP has a set of principles that unite, that unite a wide diversity of different political ideologies under that in putting forward policy, the same with any other political party except for the Liberals. But, you know, I, I, I think that saying that that's something that we should be striving for in our, in our electoral system is a bit of a divergence, and I'm not sure it benefits the country. Um, just, just on the point of um, voters, voters are dumb. I don't think anyone's saying that. I don't think voters are dumb. There's a reason why, you know, you, you have to respond to the electorate. Uh, you can't lose sight of that. And I think when, you know, people talk about parties having their best before dates or a leader having that, um, there comes a point where, you know, you, are you losing track of where the electorate's at? Are you still fresh? Are you able to get that sense? And I'm not, I think with our current system, and I don't want to defend our current system, but I do want to talk about its merits. Um, you know, no, I, I'm serious, please don't laugh at me, I, you know, because we are having a debate here. Uh, to say that somehow we can't have strong policy debates that, are, that take a wide divergence of ideology from different parts of the country and different, it's just not true, it's false. It's not what happens in your policy conventions, in my policy conventions, at the floor of House of Commons, in committee. And these are things that aren't t often talked about in the media. So again, we have to take this back to the Canadian context. And what I haven't heard on the stage today is fundamental points, proof points, in the Canadian context that show that the system's broken. All right, I know, Tasha wants to jump in. Tasha, can you, I know you want to address things. Can you just address directly the point that I think Andrew and Alex have made which is the fundamental issue of the false majority, the government that can elect below. That, that seems to me one of those, the, just those fundamental issues, everyone gets it. How do you defend the false majority as a way that actually gets representation when nine million Canadians cast a vote and they have no representation? How, what, what's the actual argument for that? Okay, the argument, obviously, it, on the face of it, it's hard to defend. I will admit that. I will say, for, no, let me out. 40% is a threshold by which we often and most often form majority governments in this country. That means that in all the races across the country, in all the ridings, a majority of seats, a majority of people won for that particular party. Yes, so on the face of it, everyone else is somehow disenfranchised. But like I said, that is not actually the case because while the majority is produced by a minority of the whole country, it is not produced by a minority of races. You have to look at the context in which it's done. And to say that simply you just look at the numbers, pure numbers, and therefore you should have 40% of the seats and then coalesce with someone else, what you're basically saying is the absolute, you cannot have anything passed ever without a 50% plus one situation. Okay, you can adopt that view as you have. You adopt that view and say that's the only definition of fairness in this country. But if we look at our country, and I do take Michelle's point on this, in Canada, what works for us in terms of regional balance, in terms of local representation? We're not saying the current system's perfect. I'm not arguing that. I admit it has flaws. But I'm not saying PR is better or what we need in its place. That is what we're debating here. PR would give us, for example, a constant war footing. You thought the minority governments and prorogation was bad under Harper? 
Good God. We'd have that all the time because we'd have coalitions. And coalitions are not happy places where people have consensus. There are some exceptions. I will grant that. I was having a conversation before this debate about New Zealand. New Zealand is one of the few exceptions. You can say, yes, PR works in New Zealand. New Zealand is very different from Canada. Okay, and to, to say we cannot take account our, our differences when we look at a, P, at, a, at a system of government is false. We have to. The second thing we would also have is the possibility of extremist parties. There's no question that extremist parties could gain a toehold. This is something we have to say, okay, if we're okay with that, bring on PR. It's a risk we take. I personally am not okay with that. So I say I prefer our current system to a PR system. I, I know you want to jump in, I know, Andrew. Talk, talk about the risk of extreme parties. I mean, look, Canada's had a long history of living with a separatist party, but what if there are other kinds of extremist parties? Not the cliche, but I mean, this happens. How do you well, deal with that argument? What if people vote for parties we don't like, is basically what you're saying. No, and, not that they don't and, like and, that. And, are antithetical to our democratic yeah, in system. In a democracy, that's different. In a democracy, we respect the choices of voters, first of all. Second of all, we're not by nature, we're not by nature an extremist country. Although, you know, as I say, Alex said, your, your definition of a loopy party is somebody else's. I mean, I look at the Parti Québécois, I would say that's a pretty loopy party. Uh, but it was able, by virtue of first past the post, to get false majorities and almost break the country up. Uh, so no, I, the, the, the fundamental thing is you've got to trust the good sense of the voters. And you can't say, because we don't trust the voters, we're going to rig the system. I want to come back to something that, that, yes. that, that T Tasha said. I mean, when she was defending the, the fact that we have 40% uh, majority governments. Uh, presumably, then, you would have no objection to 40% of the votes in Parliament being enough to pass legislation. But you wouldn't, because 50% plus one is the rule for passing legislation. Wait. Wait. All right. Finish the your fact, point, Andrew, and yeah, then the the We're going to go quickly the, now. But the defense was, well, but they each finished first in their writing, which is assuming the point you're seeking to prove, which is that the only possible way in which we construct a parliamentary democracy is if only one person gets elected in a writing by plurality. That's precisely the question that is before us. If you don't accept that, that suggestion, if you say we're not going to get of 100 percent of the representation to 30 or 40 percent of the vote, but we're actually going to have proportional representation within each electoral district, then you come up with a very different result. But you, in fact, get majority governments, real majority governments. We got 10 minutes left. There's going to be closing remarks. And I know, Michelle, you want to make a point. You did re make the point earlier, which is a kind of sub point, but it merits some discussion among. If you're going to make the change, does it require a referendum? Or, yeah. as the Liberals have said, we campaigned on it. We can have a consultation to make the change. I don't want to get trapped too deeply in that. Uh, but it's, it merits some attention. Go ahead. OK, so where I agree with Andrew is the last point is that we need to trust the voters. Um, I'm not sure that the Liberals got a mandate to unilaterally change the system in the last election. And I'm curious to know where the room is at. Um, I, I'm not saying that they didn't, look, the Liberals are going to open up this debate, we're going there. But voters didn't vote on what system we were going to. And that's why I think we need to have a referendum. I, I think that the debate we're having today here is great. I, I think it's fantastic. But the point is, is that more people need to be engaged in it. And much like the rest of the Liberal platform, there was a lot of emptiness in there. So to unilaterally take an electoral system through Parliament, which is debatable if it's even constitutional, I think is ill-advised. And I think that we should engage our electorate in probably one of the most important conversations that we've had about our democracy through a referendum. Okay, Alex, I want you to jump in, jump in again on that. And, and, and if you can, Talk about, is there a need for a referendum before this kind of change happens? Um, a, referendum, a referendum if necessary, but not necessarily a referendum. <laughs> I think the bottom line is people who oppose PR love referendum. So it, it does make you kind of suspicious about the motives behind referendum. Is if, if these people were really committed, if, the, if these people were committed to, to greater democracy, they'd support That's PR. Now, that may have been a straw. That may have been a classic straw man fallacy. article. It, 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 it's one of my favorite logical fallacies. The, the, um, <laughs> Why was that? He, 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 okay, well, give you a chance to respond. He no, just said it is his favorite straw man. Go but, ahead. But, but the, it would be a, a bit ironic to improve democracy without a strong democratic process. So it's clear we need a strong, transparent democratic process. That may not be a referendum because this is not a binary issue. You well, keep asking, you, 
Well, it could be like an all-party parliamentary committee with a sincere, transparent way of engaging Canadians to test whether a consensus is possible. And let's see what kind of consensus is possible. It could be that. But functionally, does anybody in the room believe that the Liberals will look at the consensus of an all-party caucus to put an electoral system through? How many people think that's actually then, going then to happen? Then they'll need a referendum. Yes, one person, who's likely the Liberal Party rep. Well, no, 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 that, 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 but this makes me, uh, Michelle raised a good point. If, you know, if we're cynical, which, or skeptical, whatever you want, if it's an all-party committee, but you know the Prime Minister has already weighed in on the ranked ballot, mm -hmm. is that process fundamentally fair? Let's see how it plays. And if most people think it's not fair, including the parties that were participating, it'll force another Why process. would it force it in well, a majority? Okay. I'm just asking. I'm yeah. done. Is yeah. there in a majority government? The, the majority can do whatever the heck it wants now. So, That's what's wrong the majority, with our system. You're saying that... You know, one of the reasons, one of the reasons we wonder if they have a mandate is because they only have 39%. What a yes. screwed but the up the system we have. Uh, the the ta ta Tasha, come back, come back. You're arguing, you're, you're saying that 50% plus one, that should be the threshold, but you're saying a government elected by 40%, which you don't think is legitimate, should change the threshold for everyone forever. That doesn't make any sense. Well, there should be, this is why, process. look. But the no, paradox I don't, but works both ways. But there have been referenda. Tasha, Tasha, then Andrew, then Michelle. Whenever we have looked in Canada at changing, whether it's to S... Oh, God, I'm not going to get the letters. STV. Right. Thank you. STV, thank you. Uh, or MMP. It's a family debate. Yeah. Uh, there have been referendums in several BC, Ontario, there, PI, and they have all failed um, or have not met the threshold in BC, for example. That, and the reason there was a referendum was because this was a very fundamental change, not just in the electoral system, but in the relationship of the voter to the people that would represent them. And you still have not satisfied me. You've talked about the local and, the, the, you know, Andrew, you're very interesting. I could put an org chart up here of how the ridings would be redivided, etc. You've not convinced me that is what Canada needs. The resolution is Canada needs PR. I don't think we need that. I don't think the system's perfect we have now, but we don't need what you are proposing. The, the, the paradox that Tasha refers to works both ways. The same people who insist that a government with 39% is empowered with a majority to do whatever it likes suddenly get all shirty and say, we've got to have a majority in a referendum. Uh, so uh, it seems to me we should be consistent in whether we think a majority rules or not. I'm certainly not averse to a referendum. I think the only thing I would say to people is, if you think that settles the issue of whether the Liberals will be able to game the system to, your, to their advantage, you're kidding yourself. You can do all kinds of things with how many options do you have on the ballot? How many ballots do you have? What kind of majorities do you need? Do you need majorities in each region or what have you? And so I think we need uh, all party buy-in and, and in fact outside the party system as well uh, to, to, to ensure that we get something that really has genuine consensus. I think the Citizens' Assembly that was used in BC to come up with a model that, that they would then put to a referendum, I think was a very successful exercise where people engaged very thoroughly, ordinary citizens engaged very thoroughly in debating the, the alternatives and put something forward that got not only 58% of the, of the vote overall, but won a majority in I think all but two ridings in BC and was d declared to be null and void by a government that was elected, I believe, with 43% of the vote. Michelle, you want to jump in? I think to uh, accept the point that Alex has made on an all-parliamentary committee being the simple way to solve this debate is a bit naive. Uh, the reality of that is that we should have we should have the greater electorate involved in this conversation because of the differences and the complexities that are in the multitude of different uh, systems that we could select going forward. I, I also think that there is some reality to the fact that the Liberals will take a proposal through their cabinet process, it will be baked, and then they're going to have to push that through their caucus in a vote. If there's something that comes out of that all-party committee that the NDP doesn't agree with, are they going to force their caucus members to vote for that? This is where a referendum helps. You know, you can make all of these academic arguments about percentage and whatnot, but the reality is, is that if we are going to change our electoral system in this country, I really hope that we use the opportunity to engage Canadians. And a referendum is a very a meaningful on what, way to can do I that. Ask you, a referendum on a particular system or on, a, on the idea of you, change? That's where you can use an all-party committee, right? You could go through the consultation process, you could have hundreds of witnesses, and then the Liberals could put a position out there. 
but then Canadians have to vote on it. That gives me a stronger rationale to go into the House of Commons and say yay or nay on a system because Canadians have been consulted in formally changing that and actually agreeing to that or not. So I just, I think it's a big ignorant and naive to think that somehow this is going to be settled in a way that engages all Canadians through a committee that might take can, five can days to be one, done. I know you have three minutes, but just quickly, some might wonder, is it for a position of supporting first past the post, is it a little hypocritical to ask for a referendum about when the government campaigned on it, they won first past the post, do you like the system? They can make the change that they got so what did they campaign on, Evan? Making what system? What system? Ending first past the post. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, but I don't see the system they change. No, they yes, but how? That, what does that mean? And that how? is What does that mean? That is the point. The government has to define. They did not define before the election. They told us we'd have a deficit of $10 billion. Hey, it's 30. Yeah. They told us every vote will count. What does that mean? I don't know what, the, what, they, what it's going to mean. And I think the Canadian public, if they're going to change their voting system, need to pronounce themselves and know exactly what's on the table. I, enti I entirely agree. I entirely agree that all the Liberals campaigned on was we're going to end the old system. They, they made no commitment to any new system. And I think people should be very vigilant. I'm sure there are people within the high command of Liberals who would like this whole issue to go away. And the referendum, they may, they may do like the McGuinty, the McGuinty government did in Ontario, where they basically hold the referendum and then abandon it. Uh, and they are more than pleased to see it, see it die. So people who are in favor of reform, I think, should really be holding the Liberals' feet to the fire on this. All right. Uh, two minutes left, Alex. Alex, one of the issues of, and, and, and I think that's a great point that Andrew makes, you can have a referendum, and it you, that also, if you don't sell your position, it makes it look like you've consulted, and then it actually has a service towards the status quo. So how do you actually ensure viable change on this kind of magnitude, if that's your position? Well, I, I, I think the process that the government launches is going to be key. It should be multipartisan, nonpartisan, it should engage Canadians, it should be transparent. That's the test, and we should see what comes out of that process. We should see if they actually drive such a process. I'm, I'd be open to looking at other things, including a referendum, if such a process fails to deliver a consensus that is credible and, and multipartisan. But let's let that process, which is real engagement, and the notion, you know, if you watch the referendum in BC, on, on uh, the most recent referendum on infrastructure, it was hijacked. It was, it, as complex issue was made binary, yes or no. We want an engagement that's richer, more profound, more educational. And I think that let the process uh, play out and then see what it delivers and if it delivers a substantial consensus It may be that a referendum isn't useful and don't assume a referendum is some kind of magic pill Because in fact, it's often been used to hijack the process. All right. We are now into We are now into the closing argument stage And you can get remember you'll be voting at the end so I, I don't really understand that the app technology myself <laughs> I can guess the results. All right. I'm going to produce. I'm going to produce. Let's not prejudge Don't anything. Don't despair. Hang on. <laughs> closing arguments. It's not finished. <laughs> Uh, let, let's start uh, closing arguments. Uh, Andrew, we'll, we'll do the exact same order as we began. Uh, closing arguments, about three minute-ish for your closing arguments on be it resolved that Canada needs proportional representation. Let's begin with Andrew Coyne. Thank you, Evan. In my opening remarks, I talked about the defects of the present system, the fact that it violates the principle of majority rule, violates the principle of the equality of every vote, it makes people vote strategically to avoid splitting the votes. Uh, we have essentially more, less representation by population right now than representation by accident, because you never really know what the splits of votes are going to be like. Let me turn to the, the virtues of proportional representation as the alternative, and essentially they are the mirror image, the defects of the present system are the virtues of PR. Rather than some votes counting for more than others, as under first past the post, under PR, every vote, or nearly so, every vote counts equally. Rather than focus their efforts on a few battleground ridings, parties would have to campaign hard in every part of the country because every vote helps to elect someone. Under PR, voters who now trudge to the polls feeling the whole exercise is pointless because their candidate has no chance of winning or, have to, or forced to switch their vote to some other party for fear of splitting the vote can vote for the candidate they actually prefer. Would this, as claimed, mean the end of majority governments? No, it would mean the start. 
Under first-past-the-post parties can win a majority of the seats with less than 40% of the vote. Under proportional representation, a majority means a majority. Would that mean institutionalizing the sort of crisis atmosphere we associate with multi-party governments? No, that's a function of the system we have now. Under first-past-the-post, relatively small changes in the popular vote can produce enormous swings in the number of seats. So in a minority par parliament under our system, whichever party is up in the polls at any given moment is always tempted to force an election. They all have their fingers on the button. Under PR, there's no such exaggerated payoff. Small changes in votes mean small changes in seats, and so therefore everyone calms down. Coalitions tend to endure. Wouldn't that mean handing disproportionate power to a minority of the electorate as large parties quarter the support of the smaller? You can, but there's always the next election to bear in mind. These aren't one-offs. If a small party is seen to overplay its hand or a large party underplays its hand, it will pay a price, I promise you, at the next election. And that's been shown again and again in the PR system. And again, that's more true of the present system, where parties pay almost exclusive attention to that small sliver of voters known as the swing voters, usually the least informed people in the country, the people who make up their minds at the checkout counter. <laughs> but isn't the virtue isn't the virtue of first past the post with all its distortions that it makes it easier for voters to throw the bums out? That might be true, but where is the evidence? Under first past the post, Canada has had some of the longest lasting dynasties in the democratic, or I dare say the undemocratic world. The 42 year reign of the Conservatives in Ontario, the 43 straight years under the counterparts in Alberta, the dominance of the federal Liberals for most of the last century. But what relevance, people say, to the party votes have uh, when we elect parliaments, not governments. Each riding, they will say, is a separate election in itself, and we heard that today. Quite so. But why does that require that only one member should be elected from each riding? That's the unspoken assumption. Why should only the votes cast for the first place candidate achieve representation in parliament and not others? Certainly, in any democratic system, the majority must rule. But why not make it an actual majority, not a phony one, drawn from a body that represents all of the people and not just some of them? Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. And now, first concluding remarks from the no side, from Michelle Rempel. Michelle. Thanks. I'll just take my time to, to go through some of the points that have been made and uh, just, just close with my thoughts on how to proceed. I think that the argument that was made, especially around the BC Transit referendum, that somehow it wasn't a meaning, there was no meaningful concert, consultation and there was no meaningful engagement and it was a binary, I think that's false. Because you're saying that that result wasn't democratic, it was a vote. And whose responsibility is that to engage people? Just because the result isn't something that you like, I might have not have liked the result of the election in the, last, in the last federal election, but that doesn't mean that the process wasn't democratic. Many of you did not want to see our government go forward, and that changed, and it changed under the last system. The, um, the, the point that was made around, uh, Andrew brought up around camp, it would force people to campaign in all parts of the country. I, I strongly disagree with that because what would happen on a list is that you'd look as a candidate on your, your list and the people that are gonna campaign the hardest are the people on the threshold, depending on if you get another percentage of the vote or not. And where you campaign is completely predicated upon what ideology or region your party stands to represent. I also worry about uh, what would happen. Again, we're talking about the Canadian context here, not arguing the merits in a, of PR in an academic context. I, I do worry about how, if we are going to adopt PR, how we ensure that national unity stays at the core of our decision-making process. I, I, I am concerned about that, and I'm, I also don't think it's fair for Andrew to say that we wouldn't just sort of wave off, that we wouldn't have a multitude of political parties. How do we know that? We don't have any evidence one way or the other. The point that I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of things that as an electorate, regardless of where you sit on this issue, we have to think through and think through very carefully in the context of our country. And so, therefore, I think that this debate warrants more than just you know, a five-day parliamentary committee, but it, 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 it warrants the engagement of the entire electorate, and my position is that we take this to a referendum. Okay, Michelle Rump. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. I was just summoned by Ed Broadbent. 
I'll tell you what he said in a minute. <laughs> now, he said there should be a show of hands after as well. Well, we will have a vote for a proportion. It was a good, just getting summoned by him was sort of chilling in the middle of the debate, though. All right, uh, I didn't know what was going on for a second. Uh, okay, Alex Himmelfarb uh, will also then do the, uh, the next part of the yes side, and then, of course, we'll hear from Tasha Carradine. Alex. Well, happy 80th, Ed. Um, it's pandering for votes, if you <laughs> Andrew's made clear, and I, I accept that there, the system is broken. We've celebrated that we have 68% voted in the last election because the stakes were so high. So we're celebrating that two-thirds of Canadians vote and one-third don't. And yeah, you can find Switzerland, you can find some example, but overall, empirically, PR systems have higher levels of participation by a significant amount, 68%. So, you know, cherry-picking an example here, it matters, and it matters that many Canadians think their vote is wasted or that there's no point to vote because it's a foregone conclusion in a winner-take-all. It does matter that we re-engage Canadians and give greater legitimacy. It matters most profoundly because trust in government is down in Canada like it's never been before. Trust in one another is down in Canada. And countries that have PR have a higher degree of political trust and a high degree, higher degree of social trust, and that's a good thing. So, and the, the loopy party thing just makes me crazy. You know, the Marxist-Leninists are going to get 5%. Well, I think that's cool. The, um... Okay, I'm switching sides. <laughs> <laughs> what we know is, under our current system, a loopy party can have control of government with 39%. Pick the party. Um, <laughs> PR gives us something that's more representative. That's good for a representative democracy. It makes virtually every vote count, and that's good for voter participation. It makes every region count, and that's good for social cohesion. It creates incentives for cooperation, and maybe brings an end to this divisive adversarial politics that almost all of us hate, except those of us who practice it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex. You know this is not a formal political debate because people are actually not using up all of their time, which is incredible. Uh, all right, Tasha Carradine. Thank you. Next year, Canada will celebrate its 150th anniversary, and we've survived this long with First Past the Post. Despite the problems that it has produced, I'm not saying it's perfect, we have gone through major issues of national unity, driven not only by parties at the provincial level, but of course at the federal level as well. And at the federal level, we've had many regional parties come and go, the Progressive, Social Credit, the Bloc Québécois, Reform. They've come and gone for a reason, because they've folded back into the larger parties. And my opponents will probably say that's a bad thing, because everyone has a right to assert their democratic rights, and we sh every vote should count, and maybe we should still have all these regional parties. I ask you, would Canada be a stronger country with all these regional parties still present? I don't think so. Canada does not need PR. The current system has its issues, but PR would only replace them with another set of problems. I want to quote Johnny MacDonald, who said in the 1860s, when he was working on Confederation, that it was like herding cats. Things are even more complex today. In a pluralistic, geographically, regionally, culturally diverse country such as ours, which is different from so many of the countries, in fact, I would say most that have PR, PR is not what we need. And also, by the way, it's not really what I think progressives need or any politicians of principle need. Let's look at what it would give us. Okay, if we had PR, yes, we'd have more parties. But what would we end up with? When you look at how parties would probably splinter and break apart because they wouldn't need to stay together, you would end up with, as in many PR countries, a centrist party that dominates, which coalesces with others. That centrist party would be the Liberals. Andrew says there's no that we have dynasties. We'll go to Mexico. The PRI was a dynasty for a very long time. They have PR. Okay. All right. They vote. They vote. In theory, they vote. They, every vote counts. 
We'd have regional parties in this country that would be stronger and have a greater incentive, and they would not be more progressive, let me tell you. To quote Jennifer Smith of Dalhousie University, who had a very, very interesting piece on this for Policy Options magazine, she examined how regional parties have been and acted, and they tend to be less progressive. Why? Because they are constantly lobbying the federal government or lobbying within the federal government for a regional interest, which usually involves transfers of funds for specific and often very conservative-minded projects. What PR would also give us is a constant war footing. It would be a constant state of maintaining a coalition. I don't think it would be the cuddly sort of everyone get along, you know, let's kumbaya, hold hands, and we're all going to work on this. That'd be nice. I don't see it. When you look at PR around the world, that is the exception, not the rule. And in terms of extremism, it is a real threat. When Mitterrand changed the system in France, Le Pen got a toehold when, we went to, when they went to PR. It can happen in a country, in any country, and not, we should not delude ourselves that Canada it would never, ever see anything like that. And finally, PR would also give us bigger government. It would give us bigger government because we'd need bigger government to ensure the type of local representation that Andrew wants to have or would like to see. It is false to say, furthermore, in closing, that PR would make every vote count. There would still be thresholds, which means that, as in Slovakia, as in other countries, some votes wouldn't count. There would always be votes that didn't count. And then those people would say, my vote doesn't count, and that's not fair. You know, ultimately, the goal here is to give Canada what it needs, not what, in theory, might be a better system. I don't think it's a better system. I think it's not what we need. I think what we have isn't perfect, but like democracy, it's the best system we got going. Thank you. All right, it is now time for the reality television program side where we vote on a winner. And uh, I thought it for a great debate. Now, we're going to give you a moment. You can vote at bit.ly slash prgrs16. Just, just trips off the tongue, really, doesn't it? bit.ly slash prgrs16 which is some short for progress. Okay, so do you have, do you, has everyone got that? So give you a, do you want me to repeat that or is it up on the screen there? Okay, good. Okay, I, we can't see the screen. Can I vote too? All right. So while you vote, okay, good. It's right on your, excellent, excellent. We've, we've, everyone is very well aware and we trust everyone. While we're waiting for those results, I think Ed Broadbent had, had an excellent idea. <coughs> uh, first of all, I want a show of hands. How many people, before a change would happen from this government, how many people in the room would like to see a referendum before any change? A show of hands. Yes, if you want a referendum. If you want a referendum before the Liberals make any change to first pass the post. Okay? How many, as a show of hands, would not, you don't need a, a referendum before the Liberals on, make on a change? The change. On, on the system of change. All right, so a lot of you just didn't do anything on that. Okay. All right, let's. Are, we need about 30 more seconds on that. Now, what I, I, on, before we get the vote, can we just have a round of applause for all our debaters today? I think... You know, that was, to me, that's a, a, the kind of debate we love to see. Robust, smart, funny, everybody not taking ad hominem shots, just really a smart, sharp debate about, a, I think, a very, con we all think here, a very consequential debate. And it's actually very refreshing to see. Now, we can't see the vote, but the yes has won 78%. Twenty-two percent. In some right. systems, that could be a well, majority. You a majority. There uh, you go. It's a moral victory. Did every, if every vote can, how many? Just hands up, as Ed, Ed wanted to do. Hands up. How many people would vote yes to the re resolution? Hands up. Nobody's going to do it now. Right. And, and, and no. <laughs> and no. See the nose. It's, there's some we would have gotten seats under the PR. Bias. You would have got seats under yeah, PR. Yeah, that's true. Right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to thank all four excellent debaters, and I want to thank all of you for coming here. Thank you very much.